financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vanu Podcast. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm Kyle and I'm Shane. Thank you so much for tuning in and we hope you've had a pleasant week. Shane, why don't you go ahead and bibcot this thing for us? You know, I've never done this before. I don't know if I can do it. Uh, (laughs) Since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, the Vani podcast is covered by a Bipcot no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except, except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at Bipcot.org. Nice job. Nice job. All right. So this episode is entitled Libertarians and Coercivists Redux. And the show notes can be found at vanupodcast.com slash 12. If you recall back to TVP episode number 8, which you can find at vanupodcast.com slash 8, we read and discussed an article written by Rayo that thankfully didn't make it into uh, his book, the Vanu book. Other than a couple of quite salient paragraphs, his categorization and subcategorization of who were coercers and whom were libertarians weren't great. They weren't even good. They were quite bad or otherwise inaccurate, actually. <laughs> so for that reason, I decided to write, it a, to write an updated and more accurate version entitled uh, Libertarians and Authoritarians Defined and Explained. This will be a shorter episode, hopefully, but I do think it's important, even if only for educational purposes. In other words, proofread and fact check before publication. So just in the interest of time, we'll read through portions uh, of my article, and then we'll discuss uh, elements thereof. So uh, Shane, you uh, have anything to uh, mention before we get rocking and rolling here? No, no. Other words, uh, other than, you know, proofread and fact check before publication. I think, like, we need to say, like, 12 or 13 times, like, before, like, the end of this podcast. Uh, So just go ahead. (laughs) All right. So kicking off uh, the article here, the redux, if you will. And since these were my words, I'm not going to do quote and quoting and all that since I'm I'm talking myself. Does it make sense to quote myself? I don't think so. Anyway, so let's get on going here. So a libertarian is one who advocates for a general exemption from coercion. Such an individual enjoys an anti-political philosophy whereby he adheres himself to the non-aggression principle and the self-ownership axiom. The non-aggression principle, the NAP, absolutely forbids all coercion and initiatory force. Yet self-defense, including the defense of innocent third parties, is in accordance with the NAP. Self-ownership justifies the existence of the free market by upholding the private property ethic. All right, Shane, any thoughts so far? Nope. Good definitions. Let's move okay. forward. Argumentation ethics is a logical proof that demonstrates the performative contradictions within all political arguments except those on behalf of private property. It upholds the validity of both the NAP and self-ownership by showing that individuals who argue with each other have not only forsworn coercion, that is, initiatory force, but also they have affirmed property rights by the very act of arguing itself within the moment. Fundamentally, argumentation ethics insists upon integrity by steadfastly opposing hypocrisy. Um, I will say here, at least in transitory passing before continuing on with the rest of the article, uh, argumentation ethics, uh, the non-aggression principle and self-ownership have been mentioned in previous episodes of TVP. Um, The the earlier episode on a case for non-coercion based on rational self-interest was mentioned, uh, these concepts at length, and I think it was also in the Collective Movementism episode as well, so please refer to those other episodes if you want to hear, at least in some degree, more on on those concepts. Yeah, and just just one thing, Uh, by the the, the end of the philosophy section, if you've never heard of argumentation ethics before— uh, you'll be an expert on it by the end of it, and that's good. So, go or, ahead, Kyle. or at least you'll understand it and be sick of me talking about it, right? So it's like, oh, good. So at least you're familiar with the concept, uh, which 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 is uh, better than than where a lot of people were before. 
Continuing on, the polar opposite of a libertarian is an authoritarian, which is a generic term for individuals who inflict or advocate for coercion. Authoritarians are hypocrites right out of the gate because in their very advocacy for coercion, they must exercise self-ownership within the very moment of said argumentation, thereby engaging in a performative contradiction. As such, libertarians are not required to offer rebuttals since the performative contradictions already did it for them. Although libertarians are, of course, free to point this out to the authoritarian or any passers-by for educational purposes. Uh, so, Shane, uh, do you think that uh, that's a decent application of argumentation ethics? Yes, yes, I do. So, I, if, if any of you, hope, if you're listening to the Bonnie podcast, you probably you probably don't. But if you ever watch a, watch uh, one of those uh, watch one of those movies, they're called presidential debates. Uh, the, apparently, they're entertaining, but I don't find them entertaining. Uh, but uh, if you watch, if you go up there and you watch them talking about all the policies and such, I mean, they're they're up there, you know, debating each other and arguing against private property and, and yeah, performing contradictions, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, go ahead. All right. So two main types of authoritarians can be can be said to be criminals who personally coerce others and thus are at least honest enough to shoulder the responsibility for punishment if they are caught, and statists who advocate for organized coercion by the state and thus are disingenuous because they demand that the responsibility for carrying out said coercion be done by government agents instead of themselves. There is no honor among thieves, as you said. I think it was in the, the last episode of TVP we did. But, uh, uh, but you know, I, I will say, Kyle, you know, I, 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 and it's, it's kind of weird saying this, but, you know, I have more respect for honest criminals, you know, who actually do this shit themselves. Like, if they, if they want something, they do it themselves rather than, you know, vote someone in office who, do it for, who, who will do that for them. Uh, so that's just, you know, it's kind of, it's weird saying that, right? No, know, have, well, have, having respect for, well, I guess more respect. I mean, when, when it's zero, I mean, there's not much, I mean, there's not, I don't know, whatever. I would, I would, I would even go one more step and say even the organized criminal syndicates. So like the, uh, the, the Yakuza, the Komora, the various mafiosi, uh, pick an organized criminal syndicate. Even those guys, um, are, uh, remember they have to deal both with their victims and, uh, being hounded by the government too. So they get it on at least two different fronts. So, you know, they have to really, uh, they are individually responsible, and even even whatever sense of collective responsibility is really only limited to the individual members of that particular syndicate, isn't it? So you're, mm -hmm. if you're a member of the Yakuza, there's a reason why, you know, the only exit is through death, usually, for example. But yeah, I mean, those guys actually take that kind of thing seriously. Yeah, yeah, they definitely, definitely do. Whereas, whereas yeah, we're going to take somebody's property because we had a vote. And then you can't touch us because we have, you know, partial immunity or sovereign immunity or it's a democratic election. Therefore, you can't touch us or whatever. Right. It's, you know, the the not to go on. Yeah, too if, long. You, if you were to do this on the streets, it'd be illegal. But go, you know, cast a ballot and have someone else do it for you. And that's completely it's completely fine. Uh, yeah, it's essentially. Well, well, the entire notion of your hypothetically limited government, your democratic republic is all about passing the buck. Right. So you have like the president say, I'm, I'm fulfilling a mandate by the voters. Then you have like the soldiers and the cops saying that, well, I'm just following orders. And then you have, you know, the other political actors as part of this uh, glorified democracy of ours, this republic of ours, uh, basically uh, making all sorts of excuses. And nobody is individually responsible for anything. Hence passing the buck. And that's that's what statists are doing. So at least criminals, the buck stops with them, do doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So whether it's a mugger or it's a mafia don, the buck stops with someone. With statists, the buck doesn't stop anywhere. And that's the horror of the reality of our situation, such as it is. Continuing on, most political ideologies violate argumentation ethics and thus are typically different flavors of statism. Truth be told, statists are essentially rival gangs of looters who bicker with each other as to which of them enjoys sovereignty, that is, the right to rule, and for what purposes coercion may be inflicted. These include the following. All right, so here's the list. Socialists who advocate for government ownership of businesses. Fascists who advocate for government regulation and taxation of businesses. Progressives who advocate for economic equality through coercion. 
conservatives who advocate for government regulation in accordance with tradition, globalists who advocate for coercive control of the entire planet by a single government, nationalists who advocate for coercion that increases the prestige of a particular nation-state government above that of other nation-state governments, eugenicists who advocate for the coercive extermination of certain humans they've deemed undesirables, racists who advocate for the coercive subjugation of certain races below that of their arbitrarily favored ones, decentralists who advocate for partitionment of larger governments into many geographically smaller ones, thereby culminating in a world of thousands of independent Greco-Roman city-states. These states' rights advocates prefer coercion by softer, cuddlier versions of the state. And then finally, minarchists. Uh, minarchy uh, meaning minimal statism. Yes, still statism, it's just minimal statism. Minarchists uh, who advocate for restoring a hypothetically limited government and who are little different from decentralists. Such a restoration supposedly occurs by way of inexplicably forcing a government to obey its own constitution. Ironically, this usually entails civil disobedience or civil defiance, since such unlimited governments don't really value the limitations placed upon them as enumerated in their respective constitutions. So Shane, while I kind of pause and take a breath here, what do you think about uh, that uh, recategorization of the, um, of the status? You know, I, I, I think you did a great job. Uh, I, I proofread the article, so obviously I think you did a great job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but anyways, yeah, d definitely great. And, and you know what, what, what's good about it, too, which we'll get into, is, you know, uh, the, 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 the subcategories of, you know, libertarianism or anarchism, uh, none of those will overlap with those of, you know, statism. Uh, that was the, the main one of the main issues I had with with Rayo's original article when he talked about you know like uh, decentralists and then you had like in, in the libertarian sections is like whatever the hell the the, the other subcategorization was but it's like hold on those are the exact same thing essentially and one of them is in the authoritarian section one of them is in the libertarian section uh, something's wrong here <laughs> something's wrong here so uh, yeah as as the listeners will will, will see here in, here in a moment. Uh, yeah, none of the uh, the libertarian or anarchist uh, subcategories will overlap with, you know, the the uh, the rival gangs of looters. So, right now, just for purposes of time, there are paragraphs in here that go into some more detail about how, for example, just one item among others is that these categories are by no means mutually exclusive. Uh, there can be quite a degree of overlap. So, obviously, if someone were to draw out like Venn diagrams and a bunch of circles. Uh, there'd be certain portions that would overlap and other portions that weren't. But of course, uh, you know, that would be kind of something maybe to do at another time, perhaps, is to, is, is to see how, you know, the similarities between a globalist and a socialist or a fascist and a conservative even and, and how all of that kind of works. Uh, but that I, in the article, it goes into much more detail. And I would suggest people kind of read that if they're interested in that kind of thing. Um, I would like to skip down to where... Really, the market selection of libertarians themselves, so this recategorization that I did, so I'll just kind of pick it up from there. So much like the free market itself, there is a market selection of libertarians themselves who focus and specialize on different things in their pursuit and advocacy for achieving and preserving liberty. Amongst the various flavors of libertarians, there are panarchists who advocate for voluntary governance, anarchists who advocate for the abolition of the state, voluntarists who advocate for private property without the state, syndicalists slash insurrectionists who advocate for the establishment of radical trade unions, but for whatever strange reason prefer to use the black block tactic in order to smash store windows and burn police cars, mutualists who advocate for cooperatives to replace status corporations in order to better facilitate market activity, crypto anarchists, who advocate for the use of technology, especially digital technology, in order to liberate the individual from the state, primitivists, who advocate for a return to nature, which is known as rewilding, because they believe that the state created technology to enslave us, and national anarchists, who advocate for racial separatism as a form of maintaining the peace between races. So Shane, what do you think about the, that recategorization? I think it's I think it's it's very good because it does include minarchists. Uh, 
uh, so, so yeah, that that was kind of out of the way in the uh, you know the rival gangs of looters, uh, or how, or I guess uh, for the minarchists, how little they should loot. Um, but uh, but anyways, yeah, I think yeah, I think it was uh, it, it's a good list. Uh, everything's you know defined correctly, uh, which you know didn't happen in that first one, unfortunately. I mean uh, the the anarchists. I mean th these are these are all. Yeah, all of these are anarchist schools of thought. But again, Kyle, it's really nice to uh, you know see see a, a, the subcategorization here, and uh, some of those not be applicable to the authoritarian section as well. So, uh, you know, again, Rayo uh, <laughs> uh, Rayo kind of bunched uh, all of these sorts of uh, all of these schools of thought into one under anarchism, and threw the syndicalists together with the peaceful anarchists, I guess. Which there's not really there's really no similarities between the two, other than they they claim. Uh, to not want government and uh, the the voluntarists, yeah, uh, the voluntarists and you know the proprietarian anarchists, yeah, they they really don't uh, uh, they really really don't believe in government. But uh, syndicalists, that's that's kind of a different story. Uh, so yeah, it was good to kind of see that that uh, kind of divvied out rather than you know all of these uh, these various very different uh, and and in, in some aspects very different schools of thought, you know, uh, kind of laid out individually. So I, I definitely appreciate that. Well, yeah, and and to be perfectly fair, I mean. Um... I think it would probably be fair to say that the way that I divvied it up is more accurate than Rayo's, but may not be 100% accurate, especially the list of libertarians. And and I would agree with you to some extent about uh, where do you put the syndicalists, right? Because, like, they're, like, sorry, I mean, the European tradition is more of a collectivist, you know, groupy type thing. Um, and so, you know, you can't just kind of ignore that, but at the same time, are they really authoritarian? Um, it is true they don't believe in private property, and thus they're anti-propertarian. But then, where do you lump them in? So, but, but for see, example, th this is this is the main contention I have, though, is you know, like let's say let's say there is like we get to this utopia that that Rayo kind of you know kind of you know just kind of you know pushed aside. Uh, get, uh, you know, we get to this utopia, and you know, like there there's you know the, this this market selection of you know libertarian or anarchic schools of thought. And you have uh, the syndicalists who want to go, you know, start up their trade unions, and they're right next, they're bumped up right up against, you know, like, uh, you know, a free market capitalist uh, anarchist society. If they recognize that border, they're recognizing private property, uh, the, the boundaries between, you know, the boundaries between property. Uh, and if they don't, which is kind of what I would, I would, I would tend to, you know, think would happen, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you, you've, you've, uh, I'm sure you've seen some like, you know, the, the those who cross the picket line, you, they get the, they get bashed. Uh, so you know, uh, I, I would imagine that, uh, you know, violence uh, would be used at some point, even if, it's, even if it doesn't happen immediately. Uh, once, once their, uh, you know, economy, you know, as, uh, as Mises kind of uh, wrote about with uh, economic calculation, others, others after him. Uh, yeah, once uh, things started to go badly, I think they would start to lash out. <laughs> and, well, yeah, uh, you know, you're basically... maybe, maybe, maybe try to set up a government. Uh, I don't know, though. <laughs> well, basically, you're, you're kind of saying they're dialogically stopped, right? Because they're violating argumentation ethics, I think is kind of what you're getting at, right? Because they're yeah. anti-propertarian. Okay, and yeah, I'm not denying that. Um, I, I would say this, though. Like, with, with Rayo's um, uh, two different lists or whatever, there was... It's kind of like the limited government people were, like, both coercive with their states' rights, what would he call the states' rights advocacy, but then he also had them limited government libertarians, right? So the minarchists were actually on both lists, which didn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> and and also let, let also consider this too. If the minarchists were not economically illiterate and they actually started to appreciate the nap and all that, I would suggest that perhaps if they still wanted to do their groupy stuff but they didn't want to go as far as the syndicalists, uh they would probably either be panarchists or mut or actually more likely probably the mutualists, the muties for short. No, or, um, the or the national anarchists. Actually, that's kind of an interesting one too, right? It's, because I, a lot I think, of them I do think care. It, I think it'd be between national anarchists and mutualists, honestly. Well, then again, the the uh, economic ideas of the national anarchists, which you've covered before on LUA, right, uh, is mutualist, right? Yes. So, yes, that that is, but it, it does have, and, and something I've noticed within the, I guess, uh, I guess with some individuals in the minarchist circles, and it, it seems to be kind. Of, well, obviously, actually, no, pretty. I mean, pretty, pretty widespread. I mean, uh, you know, the 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 the, uh, the fear of Muslims, which we've, which we've mentioned in previous episodes, and then also, I mean, uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they they tend to like their white folk. 
Uh, they, they just, they, you know, they, yeah. they tend to like the, the culture and the tradition and things of that nature. And that's kind of right in line with the national anarchists only, uh, you know, the, the Patriots kind of now, I mean, they, they used to kind of, you know, the, like actually be minarchists, but now it's, it's like, well, if they're, if, if the military is going to be used to go, you know, kill, uh, brown folks over in the Middle East, that's cool to them now. Uh, whereas, you know, the national anarchists are like, Hey, like, let's just like have our own communities. And uh, uh, we'll we'll have our you know our, our white community where we preserve the white culture over here. If you want to have one like right next door where you're multiracial, it's cool. We we don't care about that. We just want to make sure we can we we have our community to like carry on the white race. Uh, is, is kind of kind of how I see it. But uh, but yeah, I think I think the menarchists would fall but with, within one of those two categories, uh, or at least you know the the constitutionalists. As far as the the other libertarians. I mean that that's kind of hard though, right? I mean the yeah. government to government libertarians. I mean uh, some of them reject the non-aggression principle. Some of them just don't don't see it as valid, which is whatever. But Austin um, Peterson much? I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna give him free promotion, but I'll cut that on post production. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so some of them you know reject the reject the nap. Some of them have their their other just ridiculous nonsensical uh, sort of sort of affiliations, uh, whether it be with uh, uh, you know political crusading or whatever. Um, but I mean, aren't there aren't there menarchists who just don't politically crusade? Like they might want, if there was limited government, but now they just don't see it as as, as worthwhile. Uh, I think pre Trump, are... pre Trump, that was true. But then once Trump happened, everything changed. Hence, you know, controlled schizophrenia. See previous episode on that. Yeah, yeah. So I like your list a lot better. Well, thank you. And you know what? If someone wants to come along later and like redo the list and kind of polish it a little bit better, I mean, who knows? Maybe the syndicalists should be up uh, with uh, with the other statists, perhaps, right? Uh, because they have some serious, you know, I mean, they they make a lot of claims, right? That uh, you know, without the state, the, there uh, there would be no private property, right? That they basically view private property as an invention of the state, and therefore it's oppressive and evil, right? But of course, I would just simply say this. You know, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who actually started mutualism, uh, he changed his mind about property. He initially was of the position that property is theft, which is more of a syndicalist position. And then before his life ended, he then switched it to uh, property is liberty. And those and those jackasses still quote Proudhon on the property is theft part. It's like, are you kidding me? He changed yeah, it's his a half mind. Truth. Yeah, it's a half <laughs> truth. It's a half truth. You know, much like well, any well, no, other I mean, politician, it's, it's, it's not even a half truth. It's, it's it's just you know coming coming to a different realization. Like I used to be a constitutionalist, and then right. I realized that that was nonsense, and I was an I'm, I'm, I'm an anarchist now. Right. Uh. So like it, it's it's it, I mean it was true. I was a constitutionalist, and it is true now that I, I'm an anarchist. Uh. Just as you know, Proud Hoon was a syndicalist, and then he was a, an anti propertarian syndicalist, and then he realized that property was a good thing, and he was a mutualist. Uh. So 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 yeah, right. I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a half truth, but I, I know what you mean. Right, and, and, and just to be clear for those people who may not understand mutualism, just a brief uh, overview to so understand what's kind of going on here. Mutualism was designed as an, ideal, as an ide ideology and maybe even perhaps as a strategy of sorts to blend the more propertarian, you know, voluntarist um, uh, school of thought with, with the syndicalists, the anti-propertarian folks. And it was a way to resolve the contentions about property rights issues between the ANCOMs and the ANCAPs. So that that was actually the utility of mutualism, by the way. It was uh, some people call it market socialism, which is sounds really kind of trippy, right? Um, it's but a, that it's, it's kind of a middle ground of sorts, yeah. Well, yeah, but there's also such a thing as the moderation fallacy too, which again that needs to be judged on its own merits uh, at such time when going into really into the depths and the weeds about mutualism. But just in transitory passing here, mutualism was supposed to be like the happy medium between the happy middle between the voluntarists and, and the cynicalists and such, uh, between propertarianism and anti-propertarianism and such. Uh, with the time left remaining, I would like to kind of look at the concluding paragraphs for the article. Um, again, there's some inter uh, intervening uh, uh, paragraphs here uh, where I was basically rewriting some of what Rayo wrote about regarding technological innovation and also democide. He kind of jumped around a little bit, to be perfectly frank. Definitely, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll just pick it up from this one point and just go to the end of the article uh, and then kind of pause it in each paragraph. So. Every major government has used the threat of foreign governments to distract the attention of its hapless subjects from its own violence that it wields domestically. This is a status con game as old as recorded history. Thus, the American rulership tries to justify domestic totalitarianism as a defense against Islamic fundamentalism, even as they aid Islamist governments in the enslavement of their own people, and even as these theocracies in turn exhort their subjects with fears of American imperialism. But when, as is the present case, governments are merely quarreling over who shall rule the slaves— 
it is seldom worthwhile to aid or abet either side. Rather, one should regard both as mortal enemies and develop means of personal defense. Yeah, I <laughs> I like that. Uh, I mean, and, and see, I, I, I think there is a, the kind of a need for, or not necessarily a need, but I, I think this happened with... Uh, uh, with with some of Conkin with uh, some of Conkin's works, uh, Conkin's works too. I think some of those were were updated like to fit modern technology. Um, but but anyways, you know I, I you know or in this case, uh, you know updating it with you know uh, the uh, the fear of Sharia law uh, because you know some folks actually see that as like a, a viable fear and they, they as I said as I said just a, just a few moments ago. I mean uh, yeah against the government's uh, you know anti-war and then when it comes to the Muslims. Yeah, go bomb them. Yeah, go do whatever the hell you need to. Just, just don't, just, just kill them and don't let them into America, so-called America. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, you know, kind of updating that to the the, the boogeyman today uh, was uh, was good. It was good. Yeah, bombing and pave it, or the other term used by the war on terror proponents, um, basically turn the sandbox into glass. You know, so Despicable. that. Well, yeah, but these are the same idiots who will cry for safe spaces when their little flag is being burnt too. You know, I mean, these are the true. same guys who violate Title IV flag code and a whole bunch of other things. Different topics for another time, but just in transitory passing here. You know, these aren't people who are, you know, in favor of private property because they steal the flags, ironically, of the syndicalists. So, I mean, this is the kooky Orwellian nightmare that, that you and I are living through. Anyway, continuing on. So what is truly needed in any serious strategy for libertarian victory of any kind is a second realm one where libertarians have their own infrastructure and culture so that self-sufficiency is a reality, not a buzz phrase. Currently, there are two libertarian strategies that initially seem promising for transitioning us away from statism and towards a second realm where the market is free from coercion. Agorists, who advocate for growing the gray and black markets despite the state. Vonuists, who advocate for an invulnerability to coercion from both statists and private criminals. While there is certainly quite a bit of crossover, these two libertarian strategies are in truth a duality of each other. Kind of like mommy and daddy, Vanuism and agorism play defense and offense, respectively. Vanu is more concerned about developing and maintaining hearth and home, in a, in a manner of speaking, whereas the agora is more concerned about outcompeting the state, particularly in the context of starving the state and then smashing it once it's been sufficiently weakened enough. Yes, and I, <laughs> you know it, it, it's kind of interesting that those two kind of uh, like th those those are the two strategies that I see most viable as well. Uh, I mean, there really aren't any other ones, right, other than political crusading, uh, as as far as I see it. Um, which and not to and, and for those that are confused, you know, Von, Vonu encompasses you know survivalism and all those other things uh, that that we'll get to here in just a couple of episodes. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, ethical enclaves, you know, uh, it's something uh, kind of posited by. Uh, by Rayo, uh, you know, six or seven years before Re before uh, Konkin came out with agorism, and ethical enclaves are essentially agorism. So, uh, so yeah, I, I definitely do. Uh, I mean, different agorism is more revolutionary. Vanu, like uh, for 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 Vanuis, ethical enclaves are just a way towards you know financial independence or re reducing the tax burden or whatever whatever the uh, the reasoning may be. But I don't think it's any coincidence that those two uh, are the ones that made it onto that list. And uh, isn't it kind of interesting that Rayo had something to do with both of those? Yeah, no kidding. And mm. so, and so, yeah, I mean, like, look, I mean, even that previous list of, of the libertarians and all that, like, for example, if you strip away the, the racial c collectivism of the uh, national anarchism, it just boils down to mutualism, right? Which is basically your cooperatives and such, that so-called market socialism. And so, but even then, I mean... And this would be more of a discussion for another time going more deeply into this in terms of like uh, comparative uh, libertarian strategies, but just in transitory passing here. You know, it's not completely inconceivable that mutualism could be incorporated into agorism and or vanuism too. Because if you have your own infrastructure, that if you have your own second realm, which portions of which can be more of a groupy nature. Uh, that could arguably work, right? Rayo mentioned in his other writings about the Vanu Association, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, he, he was essentially explaining cooperatives. So yeah, I mean, I, I, as, I mean, as, as long you know, the baseline here is invulnerability to coercion. So as long as right. the folks that you're associating with aren't coercing you, then there's there's nothing wrong. There, there's there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually beneficial. He was actually you know kind of uh, interested in those sorts of things where you know he didn't have to go to like a status to get his truck fixed. And he could go to like you know some Vanu, some Vanu, and who he could trade him 
storable foods or so I, I don't know wh- whatever it is i mean it, it, i mean that's that's something that he wanted and it's uh and, and and for good reason for good reason right and we don't have to deal with uh trying to exorcise the collectivist spooks from the heads of the uh syndicalists and their assorted brethren right anyway uh last paragraph uh so for those Considering becoming libertarians of any uh, stripe, I would first suggest you go on a circuit of political field trips in order to ascertain for yourself what your own relationship with government actually is in reality. Should you then decide that government is not for you, then please feel free to begin engaging whatever forms of strategic withdrawal appeals to you individually. I would suggest you take a look at canceling your voter registration as a legal remedy during your exploration. After that point, all you can really do is begin practicing whatever types of direct action enables you to enjoy more freedom now without asking for permission and have fun doing it. Um, And that's the article Libertarians and Authoritarians Defined and Explained as part of this redux of Rayo's Libertarians and Coercivists. So, you know, that that's kind of interesting, too, is the fact that really all of Vanu really is a form of direct action, right? Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. And, And I want to mention this again. You know, have fun doing it. I mean, Ray Ray mentioned that the, the folks that would be interested in Vanu uh, back in back in his day would be those, you know, the pioneers. They they wanted to figure this out. They enjoyed figuring this out. He was an engineer. He liked engineering these ideas. Uh, I mean, uh, have fun. Have fun doing it. I mean, you know, uh, you, you still today, still today, uh, as a Vanuan, I mean, you are a pioneer. Uh, things have a lot of things have changed. Technology is is completely different. Uh, and uh, completely evolved. Maybe not completely different. Maybe in some aspects. But I mean, yeah. The, the, when I look when I look at you know Vonnie and, and ways to become invul- invulnerable to coercion, I mean, there's 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 some sort of like a passion there. There's some sort of a huh, like I like it, the, the creativity comes into play. The uh, you know how how can I trick the state this time? Like how how can I do this? This uh, <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, it's it, it's it it really is a an interesting and you know fun field to go into, uh, and <laughs> I don't know, Kyle. I, I hope you're you, like I, I, I'm sure you're you're kind of thinking the same way. But I mean, whenever we whenever we talk about uh, uh, you know when we've talked about you know in private conversations and things like the action portion of this, I mean my my mind just wanders with with all sorts of possibilities. Uh, so this isn't something like uh, I mean I mean yeah the state sucks. I mean the, the, this belief in the state sucks. You know the survival society sucks except for trading. Uh, or import export, but I mean, you know, have fun pioneering these ideas. Just have fun, you know. Uh, life's too short to be miserable all the fucking time, right? Uh, so you know, try to find as much freedom as you can. Um, and as a Vonnie win, and uh, yeah, have fun doing it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would just say that I know some people get hung up on semantics and and some other things, and in terms of uh, philosophizing and such sometimes some degree of trying to actually get like a firm definition on terms and all that is actually kind of important because that's the first duty of any good philosopher good scientist is to actually uh you know define your terms so that we can actually meaningfully communicate with each other you know communicate ideas and, and concepts and uh and whatever else to each other you know otherwise otherwise a lot of us kind of start sounding like you know the idiots at um you know, Center for a Stateless Society or some of these other, you know, even more mainstream uh, political crusading organizations where they don't define their terms. And so, for example, when they say things about capitalism this and capitalism that, just to use one example of such term, um, people are operating with different definitions of what that word means. Yes. And and that's just kind of a fait accompli because no one ever bothered to take like five minutes or less and actually define. And it doesn't even have to be a perfect definition, but just an operating definition so that you can meaningfully communicate. Because a lot of times, a lot of misunderstandings that people have once you actually start putting concepts or, excuse me, uh, syllogisms together, right? You, 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 even if it's something simple like a two-premise, one-conclusion syllogism, right? Premise one, premise two, and then a conclusion. Mm-hmm. When you have these, when you start putting together, to, you know, a syllogism or five syllogisms, and then you have like a theory or whatever. Um, the reason why there's a lot of misunderstandings and arguments and all that is because a lot of that stuff is based off of different conceptions and definitions of these otherwise exact same terms. So, for example, uh, someone who's an ANCAP would define capitalism differently than someone who's, let's say, a Bernie Sanders-type democratic socialist. And thus, they can't meaningfully communicate. I'm not saying they should agree with each other. I'm simply saying that if, if 
clarity is preferable to agreement, which is something a lot of people miss. If clarity is preferable to agreement so we can meaningfully communicate, um, it's a little hard to do that if there's no conception for you know the words we're using. So some degree of trying to get definitions for things is important. And again, those lists of the of the authoritarians and libertarians was an attempt to just list it like, okay, this is a socialist, and then I define it as I already read it, right? And you know, th- you know, this is what this guy believes very simply and so forth, right? And and that's just what it is. I was just trying to define terms and then yeah, and then so like the rest of the article is basically just trying to kind of extrapolating from there. Uh, but yeah, the problem with Rayo's original article was with some issues of definitions, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was, and and kind kind of to extrapolate this out to, to all of season one. I mean, that's kind of what we've been doing, right? We've been we've been kind of laying the groundwork and getting on, you know, like getting a solid a solid you know framework for for moving forward when we go into uh, uh, you know into the action portion, and uh, uh, and and you know I, I, I'm sure. Uh, when we when we when we discuss some things, I mean, we're we're going to mention you know, mutualism or you know s- some other schools of thought, and thankfully we've already covered that, you know, uh, you know, uh, substantially enough to where you know the listeners will, um, <laughs> you know, be able to uh, or if they hadn't already, they they know what we're talking about. So we're we're laying a we're laying a you know foundation right now, uh, you know, more philosophical, but uh, it will be it will be relevant uh, for. You know the action portion as well. Like this stuff will all it all kind of recycle back, so to speak. Right. And as we uh, close out here, Shane, any uh, thoughts you have to uh, leave the listeners with regarding uh, this redux of libertarians and coercivists? I like it a lot better. Um, <laughs> I definitely do. I've already I've already mentioned why 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 I like it better. But uh, I guess uh, other than that, two more episodes, folks, and we're into the action. <laughs> what I'll say in conclusion mainly is that. I think it's important to define your terms and, and also try and use uh, definitions that obey Occam's razor and that also don't conflict with other terms that you're also defining within the same written work, right? So that was something Rayo was kind of screwing up mm-hmm. on was, you know, the, like, again, the minarchists, the limit, limited government advocates were on both, were both like libertarians and authoritarians simultaneously or different types, right? Like the state's rights advocates were authoritarians, but not the limited government libertarians, as he described it, which was really fucking confusing. Oh, yeah, I have one other thing. Proofread and fact check before publication. Amen to that. We've only mentioned that twice. We probably should say it a few more times before the podcast. No, I'm just kidding, but... (laughs) (laughs) Proofread and fact check before publication, or else you'll look like a fool. Yeah, and then you'll have people like us in the future kind of making a point about this and, and taking, up, taking up everybody's time. But in the interest of taking up everybody's time, in order to reduce future opportunity costs. See what I did there, Shane? I just used time preference. preference. Oh, <laughs> bada bang. See, all the Austrian economist type people are, are like clapping their hands right now, right? All the praxeologists and so forth. Yeah, they should be proud. Um, I but, guess the but, only- then, but then again, those with uh, <laughs> those with uh, those that, that that can't like foresee that that, that time preference there, or think, oh God, I just want to I want to know this now. I mean, uh, you know, Vani was something that's it's a lifestyle change, so those folks might not be interested, unfortunately, uh, or or it might be you know uh, too far down the road that they that they uh, you know can't can't envision that can't envision that. Uh, but just kind of another thing on time preference, but yeah, whatever. Okay, very last closing thought then. On time preference, and especially r- related to this more kind of philosophical material, why should anybody bother listening to us for, for however long? It's just simply this. We're trying to save you a lot of time and effort and a lot of heartache. So instead of you, a lot of what, you know, typical mainstream political activity, like political crusading, for example, see previous episode on that. Instead of doing things like that for months and months and months, or actually maybe I should say years and years and years and years over different election cycles, right? Instead of all that, Maybe like consider listening to these episodes, which is very highly condensed, doesn't take up anywhere nearly as much time as political crusading does. And in a lot just, of just, ways, just one libertarian party meeting. Bada bing. There you go. I got it. <laughs> I, I, I even even mentioned the political field trips in this article. Right. Which is its own separate method and, and so forth. So, you know, there's there's kind of that. but the idea here, folks, is, is to reduce your opportunity costs and to really kind of, you know, because of time preference and all that. So that's that that's pretty much that. So. That's all we have for you. Thanks so much for tuning in. The website is vanupodcast.com. We'll talk to you next week.